A few minutes to 10. So I think um, we're going to make a start. So I'll just, uh, I'm Yifei, I'm the event director for Oxford China Forum for this, um, uh, this session. I'm just going to do a two minute introduction of OCF as an organization and uh, Professor Van Norden. Uh, and after that, I'll just um, leave him to get started. Uh, so OCF is a, a student run organization affiliated with the Oxford China Center. Uh, and um, our aim is to facilitate sort of academic discussions on all topics around China. And um, this event is our, uh, our first event this term uh, in a series of, uh, sort of online mini uh, sessions. And uh, so we're really honored to have Professor Van Norden uh, from Vassar College USA and Wuhan University China uh, to join us this evening or this afternoon or wherever you are in the world. Uh, and um, he is an expert in Chinese philosophy, has produced multiple texts, I think more than 10, edited and, and, um, and wrote those books on Chinese philosophy. And I think uh, his Mencius translation is, uh, is sort of the, the authority uh, um, in, the, in the realm of uh, Chinese philosophy in the West. And um, yeah, without further ado, uh, I think I'll leave Professor Van Norden to give his presentation, which will last about 45 minutes. And after that, I'll be hosting, a, I think, a short Q&A session. And because we have about 40 people, that's quite a lot. I think um, we'll keep people muted. And if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box and I'll, I'll get them to Professor Van Norden. Right, great. All right, well, thank you very much to everyone for uh, coming today. Uh, I know it's a little unusual to be having a talk uh, in this format because of the pandemic, but I'm glad we're all socially distancing. My topic today is learning from Chinese philosophy. And I'm gonna start with just some quick statistics that I think are kind of interesting and even shocking uh, when you, you, you finally realize what they are. So first, let's ask ourselves, in the United States, which doctoral programs in philosophy offer an area of specialization in Chinese philosophy. It turns out just these programs do in the United States, right? So this is a list of the doctoral programs in philosophy in the United States that where you can specialize in philosophy. So in other words, that is 12 of the approximately 120 doctoral programs in philosophy in the US. Now, you think about it, that's kind of shocking, given how fascinating and important Chinese philosophy is. And occasionally I have people say, well, what's the big deal? Okay, there's only uh, about 10% of the doctoral programs in philosophy in the United States. Can you actually specialize in Chinese philosophy? So what? You can study it in East Asian languages and cultures or area studies or something like that. But the fact is, that philosophers use distinctive methodologies for studying texts and they ask distinctive questions. And it's simply not the case. I wish it were the case, but it's not the case that program, area studies programs typically hire people who actually approach texts with a philosophical perspective. Um, it's generally not the case that East Asian, I, I have some colleagues in East Asian languages and cultures who do wonderful work on Chinese philosophy, but as a rule, it's not the case that programs in East Asian languages and cultures uh, offer, have people who approach texts in a philosophical way, use a philosophical methodology, or ask philosophical questions of those texts. So it is significant that very few doctoral programs in philosophy actually allow you to study Chinese philosophy. Now, another concern one you, might, you might have about this is you might say, well, yeah, but this is just the United States. What about the rest of the world? Uh, well, uh, you know, there's not many more programs in the English speaking world in general. If you also take into account uh, Canada and Hong Kong and Singapore, you can add a few more places to this list, but still the vast majority of philosophy departments in the English speaking world, and not just in the English speaking world, but in the West in general, including Europe and South America, very, very few programs, less than 10% or less, offer any expertise in Chinese philosophy. And in less than 10%, can you actually have an area, uh, write a dissertation on Chinese philosophy? Well, why is that? Why are we in this situation where it's almost impossible to study Chinese philosophy 
in a philosophy department. I ask people whether they've ever thought about adding Chinese philosophy to their philosophy programs, and I get some arguments about why you should not include Chinese philosophy and philosophy departments, but they're not really good arguments. And I like to just call them sophistries against teaching Chinese philosophy uh, because they're, they're never very good arguments. Like what arguments do people give? Well, one sophistry against teaching Chinese philosophy as philosophy is that I've been told, oh, there is no such thing as Chinese philosophy. Really? Uh, well, that's kind of a surprise to me because here are two anthologies uh, of Chinese philosophy. Um, and this is shameless self-promotion, of course, because I co-edited uh, each of these anthologies. But still, if somebody, I do get people who will look me in the eye and say, oh, there's no such thing as Chinese philosophy. That's why we don't teach it. Here you go. Here's two anthologies, uh, one of classical Chinese philosophy and one of later Chinese philosophy from the Han Dynasty up through the 20th century. So clearly there is such a thing as Chinese philosophy. Another sophistry against teaching Chinese philosophy that I sometimes get is people will tell me, well, philosophy refers only to the intellectual tradition that grows out of Plato and Aristotle by definition. After all, philosophy is a Greek word, you see, philosophia. And so only people in the Anglo-European tradition can be philosophers. This is a terrible argument for a variety of reasons. One problem with this argument is that if this argument were sound, then it would follow that there is no geometry outside the tradition that grows out of Euclid. Because after all, geometry is a Greek word. Um, but there is geometry outside the tradition that grows out of Euclid. Another reason that this second sophistry is a sophistry is a bad argument is that if this argument were sound, then rigorously trained philosophers would simply not recognize any philosophy, so-called philosophy, outside the Anglo-European tradition. But they, in fact, do. Let's look at each of these points in a little bit more detail. So first, this is what we parochially in the West refer to as the Pythagorean theorem. Um, I assume everybody learned this in uh, high school geometry, but just in case, a quick review. If you have a right triangle, a triangle that has a right angle here, the length of the hypotenuse, right, uh, is in a relationship to the length of the other two sides, specifically the square of the length of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the lengths of the other two sides. We call that the Pythagorean theorem, traditionally attributed to Pythagoras, and there's, a, of course, a formal proof of it in Euclid's elements. But there is another proof of it independently in the ancient Chinese mathematical work, the Zhou Bi, Suan Jing, and contemporary mathematicians have examined the proof in the Zhou Bi, Suan Jing, and they not only say that it is perfectly sound, but in fact, the ancient Chinese proof of this theorem is, in the opinion of professional mathematicians, more elegant than the proof in Euclid's elements. So why is that so important? What it shows is that what makes something a particular field, whether it's geometry or philosophy, is not some historical accident of what word we happen to use in our language and the etymology of that particular word in our language. It's the methodology and the topics that people pursue in doing that. So there's not only geometry in the West, even though geometry is from a Greek root. And so likewise, there's not only philosophy in the West just because philosophy happens to be a term that goes back to ancient Greece. Secondly, if this argument were correct, if it were true that there really isn't any philosophy in China, then it should follow that rigorously trained philosophers, when they look at what people are doing intellectually in places like China, they should not recognize it as philosophy. But in fact, when Europeans first encountered Chinese philosophers, they immediately recognized it as philosophical. The first translation into a European language of the Analects, the sayings of Confucius and his immediate disciples, was a translation into Latin 
done by Jesuits. And of course, Jesuits have extensive philosophical training as part of their, their, their training at, to become Jesuits. And they translated the Analects, the sayings of Confucius into Latin under the title Confucius Sinarum Philosophus, which means Confucius, the Chinese philosopher. And then once philosophers in Europe began to read this Latin translation of the Analects, they immediately recognized it as philosophical. In fact, Leibniz was fascinated by Chinese philosophy. And he actually said, certainly the Chinese surpass us, though it is almost shameful to confess this, in practical philosophy. That is in the precepts of ethics and politics adapted to the present life and the use of mortals. In fact, there was a little bit of Sinophilia among intellectuals in the European Enlightenment. Uh, Christian Wolff isn't as commonly studied today as he has been in the past, but he was a major figure in the German Enlightenment. And he gave a public talk and the, the English translation of the title of the talk is Discourse on the Practical Philosophy of the Chinese. And this talk really got him in trouble because in this talk, Christian Wolf argued that philosophers like Confucius show us that it's possible to have a, an ethical system that does not depend on the existence of God and does not assume the existence of God as a premise. Oh, by the way, quick, quick reminder, if you just joined us, make sure that your microphone is turned off. So please make sure your microphone is turned off if you just joined us, thank you. Um, and uh, so, and Wolf got in a lot of trouble for this talk in which he said that, well, Confucius can show us that we can have an ethics without belief in God. And he was forced to leave his position. He was fired from his position and had to leave the country overnight on pain of death if he had stayed. But as we say in contemporary academy, academia, he had a good bounce. He had a good bounce because he ended up at another institution. And then just a few years later, he gave a second talk whose title could be translated on the philosopher king and the ruling philosopher in which Wolf praised Chinese rulers for consulting and listening to the wisdom of philosophers like Confucius and his later follower, Mengzi. And we're gonna say a little bit about Mengzi in just a few minutes. Finally, Francois uh, Canet wrote a work, Chinese Despotism. And uh, Canet was one of the founders of laissez-faire economics. Uh, I'm not a fan of laissez-faire economics myself, but historically it's been important. Uh, and uh, Kenet admitted that he was inspired by the Confucian and Taoist notion of uwe, non-action, in developing the notion of uh, laissez-faire economics. And he actually took inspiration from Sage King Shun, who supposedly ruled through non-action, and he said that this should be a model for how European rulers should rule. Uh, incidentally, American President Ronald Reagan once cited uh, the Tao Te Ching of, attributed to Lao Tzu in one of his State of the Union addresses, uh, continuing the surprising association between advocates of laissez-faire economics and Chinese philosophy. So given that when people in the West first encountered Chinese philosophy, they immediately recognized that it was philosophy, uh, what happened? You know, why is it that now it's almost impossible to study Chinese philosophy in a philosophy department? This book by my col colleague, Peter K.J. Park, is, is a terrific exploration of this, Africa, Asia, and History of Philosophy, Racism and the Formation of the Philosophical Canon. Park points out that in the 18th century, there were three major theories about the origin of philosophy in Europe in the 18th century. The first major theory in Europe about the origin of philosophy was that philosophy originated in Africa, especially in Egypt. And from Africa, philosophy was given to, it was imported into Greece. So that was one theory that was dominant in the 18th century about the origin of philosophy. 
The second theory that was influential about the origin of philosophy in, uh, in the 18th century was that philosophy first developed in India and then from India, philosophy was imported to ancient Greece. Now, I'm sure you can imagine what the third major theory was. The third major theory was that India and Africa independently both developed philosophy and both of them gave it to ancient Greece. In other words, the view that philosophy originated in ancient Greece was a minority view in the 18th century. It was considered a kook view to think that philosophy originated in Greece. Now, whether you accept these theories of the origin of philosophy in Africa and, or India or not, the point is it was not considered an a priori claim that philosophy originated in ancient Greece. Uh, the belief that philosophy originated in Greece arrived fairly late. It developed, especially in the early 19th century, as part of pseudoscientific racism, which claimed explicitly that people who weren't white were not capable of doing philosophy. And I have to confess, although I'm a fan of many aspects of the philosophy of Kant, in some ways, I consider myself a neo-Kantian when it comes to epistemology, we shouldn't allow that to blind us to the fact that Kant was a major figure in convincing people of these racist views about the origin of philosophy. Um, in his lectures on anthropology, uh, Kant says, the race of the whites contains all talents and motives in itself. And if you wanna learn more about Kant's views on race, a great article is this one I cite here by Mark Larimore, Sublime Waste, Kant on the Destiny of the Races in the Canadian Journal of Philosophy. So Kant says, the race of the whites contains all talents and motives in itself. The Hindus have a strong degree of calm and all look like philosophers. That notwithstanding, they are much inclined to anger and love. They thus are educable in the highest degree, but only to the arts and not to the sciences. They will never <laughs> achieve abstract concepts. The race of Negroes, and I apologize, this is also offensive, I know it is, but we have to face this stuff. I don't mean to make, make light of it. The race of Negroes is full of affect and passion, very lively, chatty, and vain. It can be educated, but only to the education of servants, i.e. they can be trained. The indigenous American people are uneducable, for they lack affect and passion. They are not amorous and so are not fertile. They speak hardly at all, care for nothing, and are lazy. Um, the contemporary alt-right, um, sadly, has learned a lot from Kant. Kant categorized the Chinese as being on the same level as the, the people in South Asia, or what he called the Hindus. And a great article about this is by Julia Ching, Chinese Ethics and Kant in Philosophy East and West. And she quotes Kant as saying, philosophy is not to be found in the whole Orient. Their teacher Confucius teaches in his writings nothing outside a moral doctrine designed for the princes and offers examples of former Chinese princes, but a concept of virtue and morality never entered the heads of the Chinese. Now, sometimes people ask me, uh, why, why is this so important? Why do we need to, you know, dredge Kant, uh, you know, through our concept of political correctness? And why do we have so, to bother criticizing him? So now I have it working. The answer, but I had to oh, and, have and by the, the way, if you're, uh, remember, if you joined us late, please remember to, to oh, mute your That's microphone. Uh, I think, uh, I, you might want to mute your microphone if you haven't done so already. Mr. Grohl, Daniel Grohl, you might want to mute your microphone. Thank you. Um, sorry. So, so why do we have to keep bringing this up? I mean, obviously, you know, Kant lives in a very different era. Yes, he has some offensive views. What difference does it make? The difference it makes is that although, of course, the vast majority of professors in contemporary philosophy departments would not share Kant's explicit racism, they still are influenced by the views of Kant, which as Peter Park demonstrates, documents explicitly, were written into later philosophy textbooks, which claim that all philosophy goes back only 
to the ancient Greeks. So Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, Africana philosophy, indigenous American philosophy were written out of the history of philosophy by later followers of Immanuel Kant and Park uh, demonstrates this. They wrote it out of the history of philosophy, whereas before people in Europe had recognized Chinese, East Asian, South Asian, and African philosophy as actual philosophy. So the fact today that when you tell a philosophy professor, you ask them, why don't you teach Chinese philosophy? And they say very authoritatively, there is no Chinese philosophy. There is no philosophy in India. There is no philosophy in Africa. That is the heritage of Kant and the Kantians rewriting the history of Western philosophy. So that's why we've got to dredge this stuff up because it's still having an influence today in the form of institutional racism. Well, a third sophistry I'll hear against teaching Chinese philosophy is, well, there may technically be Chinese philosophy, but it just isn't any good. And uh, we actually owe a debt to uh, American Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, because in the United States Supreme Court decision that legalized gay marriage in the United States, which was Obergefell v. Hodges, uh, Justice Kennedy writing in the majority opinion quoted Cicero and Confucius on the centrality of marriage to human life. The majority opinion by Ken Justice Kennedy did not claim that Cicero and Confucius supported gay marriage, but it did point out that both Cicero and Confucius, think great philosophers in very different traditions, had emphasized that marriage is a central institution in human life. And so the majority opinion went on to say, since we all acknowledge the importance of marriage in human life, it is unfair discrimination against people who happen to be gay or lesbian to deny them the opportunity to get married. You may agree with the decision, you may disagree with it. I personally am delighted by it. Uh, but in any case, that was the context in which they cited Confucius. In his searing dissenting opinion, Justice Antonin Scalia said, the Supreme Court of the United States has descended from the disciplined legal reasoning of John Marshall and Joseph Story, who were famous justices, to the mystical aphorisms of the fortune cookie. So Scalia was just horrified that his colleagues had the temerity to actually cite a Chinese thinker in the majority opinion. Now, for some strange reason, there's kind of a cult of Scalia, Scalia passed away a few years ago. There's kind of a cult of Scalia among American conservatives. And so I've actually had some people argue with me about this quotation and say, oh, you're being unfair to Scalia. What Scalia is pointing out is that fortune cookies are not an authentic part of Chinese cuisine. <laughs> and so Scalia is objecting to the cultural appropriation of Confucius in the majority opinion. He's not suggesting that there's nothing to Chinese philosophy except the mystical aphorism to the fortune cookie. I've read carefully Scalia's entire opinion. I've read a number of opinions by Scalia. I guarantee you Scalia does not care about cultural appropriation and Scalia has no idea that fortune cookies are not an authentic part of Chinese cuisine. And it's quite clear in context that he's simply disgusted that anybody would even cite someone like Confucius in anything as august as a US Supreme Court decision. Now we actually kind of owe a debt here to uh, Scalia um, because he said uh, that, um, uh, and I'm told I'm able to mute everybody, but I don't know how to do it, I'm afraid. So, uh, so yeah, if, you're, if your microphone happens to be on, please remember to, to mute it. Um, but, uh, but we kind of owe a debt here to Scalia because he said explicitly what many people think or whisper to like-minded colleagues over drinks at the faculty club that, well, there may be technically philosophy in India and Africa and indigenous American philosophy and Chinese philosophy, but it's really not very good. Well, let's take a look and see. So philosophy um, could be said to begin uh, 
Okay, click all and be told how to mute everybody. Uh, admit all, ah, mute all. Okay, great, thank you. Mute all, uh, yes, mute all. There we go, thank you. Okay, so Chinese philosophy, uh, it, you could argue about when it begins, but usually when you're doing a survey of Chinese philosophy, you'll start with Kongzi, better known in English as Confucius. Confucius is a Jesuit Latinization of his name. And we have pretty good dates on Kongzi. He probably lived from 551 to 479 BCE. He lived in a time of civil war and social chaos in China. And so he was inspired by this to try to figure out how can we solve the problems that we have in society? What is the right way the Tao, what is the right way to live and the right way to organize society to solve this, this chaos and injustice that we see in our society. And if you know Plato's seventh letter, which I happen to think is authentic, but even if you, you don't think the seventh letter by Plato is authentic, it certainly is an ancient interpretation of what Platonism is about. The seventh letter, the seventh epistle by Plato, Plato says he's driven to philosophy by seeing how unjust governments are in his own era. And likewise, Kungze is driven to philosophize by the suffering and injustice in his own society. And interestingly, Plato and Confucius have responses to the injustice in their societies that are somewhat similar. They both advocated rule by virtuous individuals. They said the way to solve society's problems is to cultivate virtues and in individuals and then to get those individuals into positions of authority. But Plato and Kungza had substantial differences over how you cultivate virtue and in individuals and what that would look like. So Kungza said that virtue can be taught by a combination of habituation which of course is something that is suggested by Plato and also is made explicit as a way of cultivating virtue by Aristotle. But also Confucius thought that part of the education that makes you a virtuous person is studying the classics of poetry and history, which is a significant difference from the emphasis on, for example, mathematics in the education of guardians in Plato's Republic. A further difference between Confucius and Plato, although they agree that the way to solve society's problems is to get virtuous people in positions of authority is that Confucius thought that filial piety and loyalty create agent relative prohibitions and obligations. So in other words, Confucius thought because of what you owe to your parents for what they've done in raising you and because of what you owe to your friends and your community because of their roles in constituting your identity. You have agent relative obligations to them, which in some cases can trump your obligations to the community as a whole. So for example, while Confucius was traveling from state to state trying to find a ruler who would put into effect benevolent government, government for the benefit of the common people, he encountered one ruler, the Duke of Sha who bragged to Confucius saying, people in my state are so virtuous that a son turned in his own father for stealing a sheep. And Confucius said, I don't consider that virtuous. I consider it virtuous if a father protects his son and a son protects his father. And to this day, this is a hotly debated passage with some people both in China and outside China saying a really virtuous son would turn in their father if uh, their father committed a crime, uh, whereas other people saying, no, this is very realistic. I mean, the example I like to use is suppose you found out that your father was cheating on his income tax, which is about as serious a crime as stealing sheep in ancient China. Um, would you turn in your own father for cheating on his income tax? Um, I wouldn't. I'd try to persuade him to mend his ways, uh, but I, I wouldn't turn in my own father for that. And I think that's in part because I have an agent relative obligation to my father, which in some cases can trump my normal obligations to the community. But maybe I'm uh, benighted. If you think that Confucius is wrong about this, then you're going to like the next major philosopher, Mozart. Oh, by the way, my uh, image here is taken from a poster for a biopic uh, 
about Confucius that came out in China a few years ago, it's not a very good movie. Um, so I, I can't recommend it, but I, it is interesting that there's a major motion picture that came out just a few years ago in China, just about uh, Kungza. Uh, my next image here is from a stamp series, and I actually have these stamps here at home. Uh, the stamp series is Ancient Thinkers. And this particular, and this is a, an official Chinese government stamp, postal stamp, and this is Muadza, who is the first major critic that we know of, of Confucianism. And Muadza is a universal consequentialist. And so if you're a philosopher, you know, a consequentialist is someone who judges either acts or rules or institutions, depending on what kind of consequentialist they are, by their tendency to promote certain good, usually non-moral consequences. And in particular, Mordza argued that we should judge institutions and rules by their tendency to maximize wealth, populousness, and social order. And notice each of these things is in principle quantifiable. You can quantify how much wealth there is. You can quantify how big the population is. You can quantify social order in terms of how few instances of murder, assault, uh, stealing, uh, fraud, et cetera, occur in society. So I think Mozart liked these standards because you could precisely quantify them. And as we all know, in the case of Western utilitarianism, particularly formulations, like a simple formulation like Bentham's, it's hard to know how to quantify and compare pleasure and pain across different individuals. But Mordza picked consequences that you could actually quantify. And sometimes people are surprised to see populousness on this list because we tend to think of China as a country that has an overpopulation problem. But for most of Chinese history, the problem wasn't overpopulation. It was underpopulation. In the era that Kungza and Mordza lived, uh, there was an underpopulation problem because of the continual warfare and the dislocations uh, and interruptions in farming that occurred because of warfare. So actually rulers sought very aggressively to get people to join their states and they wanted to increase population. It wasn't until the so-called rice revolution of the Song dynasty that China, Chinese population really began to boom. Now, Mozart also advocated impartial caring, which basically meant that contrary to what Confucians claimed, you would not have agent relative prohibitions or obligations. So it seems likely that Mozart would say, uh, in the case that Confucius talked about, where Confucius said, you know, a son should protect the father, a father should protect the son, even if the father did something like stealing a sheep, Mordza is more likely to say, no, actually the son should have turned in his father because you should care impartially for the well-being of everybody. And that doesn't mean that you can't treat people differently, but if you treat people differently, it has to be justified by maximizing the impartial well-being of everyone overall. So Mordza is the first major critic of Confucianism uh, and it advocates a kind of universal impartial consequentialism as opposed to Confucius's view. Now the Moists don't just assert these things, they actually give some interesting arguments. And one of the most famous Moist arguments is the caretaker argument. Mordza says, suppose there were two people, one who maintains partiality and one who maintains impartiality. And so the person who maintains partiality would say, how can I possibly regard the well-being of my friends as I do my own well-being? How can I possibly regard the parents of my friends as I do my own parents? And so when his friends are hungry, the partial person does not feed them. When his friends are cold, he does not clothe them. When his friends are ill, he does not nurture them. And when his friends die, he does not bury them. This is what the partial person says and what he does. But this is not what the impartial person says, nor is this how he acts. The impartial person says, I have heard that in order to be a superior person in the world, one must regard the well-being of one's friends as one regards one's own well-being. One must regard the parents of one's friends as one regards one's own parents. Only in this way can one be a superior person. 
And so when the impartial person's friends are hungry, he feeds them. When his friends are cold, he clothes them. When his friends are ill, he nurtures them. And when his friends die, he buries them. This is what the impartial person says and what he does. So we've got two radically different personalities described, the partialist and the impartialist. Then Moses says, consider the following choice situation. Suppose one must put on one's armor and helmet and go to war in a vast and open wilderness where life and death are uncertain. Or suppose one was sent by one's ruler or high minister to the distant states of Ba, Yue, Qi, or Jing and could not be sure of either reaching them or ever returning from one's mission. Under such conditions of uncertainty, to whom would one entrust the well-being of one's parents, wife, and children? Would one prefer that they be in the care of an impartial person? Or would one prefer that they be in the care of a partial person? I believe that under such circumstances, there are no fools in all the world. Even though one may not advocate impartiality, one would certainly want to entrust one's family to the person who is impartial. But this is to condemn impartiality in word, but prefer it in deed, with the result that one's actions do not accord with what one says. And so I don't see what reason any person in the world who has heard about impartiality can give for condemning it. So Mordza invents this situation, which is almost game theoretic in its precision, where you're confronted with a choice. And he says, even though you might advocate partiality in words, the actions you would take in this choice situation show that you really favor impartiality. And that means that we Moas are correct in favoring impartiality over Confucian partiality. Now, I'm still a Confucian at heart. So I think there's a, there's a mistake in Mordz's argument. And we might, if you want, we can talk about in the discussion section what it is. My students usually enjoy talking about this a lot, but we can't say this isn't philosophy. And if you want to say, well, but it's philosophy, but I think it's a mistaken argument, most of what you teach in philosophy is arguments that you think are mistaken. We philosophers are a contentious bunch. I teach lots of different philosophers. Most of them, I think, are wrong about most things. That doesn't mean they're not philosophers. It doesn't mean it's not valuable to think about what they said and why you agree or disagree with it. So Mwadza, very just one sample of the many arguments you can find in the, the Moist writings. Now, the next major figure in the Chinese tradition is Yang Zhu, who probably lived in the fourth century BCE. He doesn't get a stamp. Uh, for reasons that will be clear in a moment. Um, he's probably, I would say, an ethical egoist. Uh, and he's a very particular kind of ethical egoist. He seems to have argued that human nature is purely self-interested. So if you're a philosopher, you know there's a distinction between psychological egoism and ethical egoism. A psychological egoist says the only motive humans actually have is self-interest. An ethical egoist says humans have a bunch of motivations, but the only motivation they have a good reason for having is self-interest. So young Jews seem to believe that we're brainwashed, as it were, by society or we're fooled by society into pursuing goals and having motivations that are not self-interested. But these motivations, because they're artificial, they're artificial violations of our human nature, and they're not in our self-interest. It's actually in our interest to overcome the mistaken propaganda society gives us about altruism and benevolence and integrity, and instead act in our own narrow self-interest. Now there's also an alternative interpretation of Yang Ju where it appears that he might also argue that human nature includes self-interested, but also familial affection. So it's natural to care about yourself, but also natural to care about your spouse and your children, but not natural to care about the well-being of society as a whole. It's a little hard to know what Yang Ju thought because he didn't leave behind any writings that we can definitely attribute to him. And in a way that makes sense. The guy's an egoist. 
So you know, if you talked at Young Jew, he'd probably say, well, I'm happy to chat with you just to pass the time of day, but why should I write anything down? What's in it for me if I write down something to help you? Because after all, I'm an egoist. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time writing things down and teaching people for your benefit. How would that benefit me? But we do have some writings that may have been inspired by Yang Ju. And one of those is sometimes called the Robert Jur Dialogue. Robert Jur was a famous robber uh, in ancient China, but also one who was sometimes uh, glamorized a little bit. And so uh, I don't know what works for, for you, but I think of people like Bonnie and Clyde or Al Capone, famous criminals in US history who are sometimes romanticized a little bit. Um, and in this dialogue, it's a fictional dialogue where Confucius goes to Robert Jur and tries to convince Robert Jur to give up his life of crime and become a virtuous Confucian. Robert Jur is not having any of it. And so he finally gets disgusted with Confucius and says, let me tell you something about the human essence, right? what it really is to be a human. The eyes want to see colors. The ears want to hear sounds. The mouth wants to taste flavors and the emotions want fulfillment. People live at most 100 years, usually 80, sometimes 60, subtracting time spent recovering from illness, mourning death and fretting over worries. There are only four or five days a month people can open their mouth and laugh. Heaven and earth go on for, forever, but people die when their time comes. Put this perishable good in that eternal space and its time flashes by like a galloping horse past a crack in the wall. If you're not gratifying your wishes and cherishing your days, then you do not understand the way, the right way to live. I reject everything you say. Go home right now without another word. This way of yours is a crazy, fraudulent, vain, empty and artificial business. It's no way to fulfill your true self. So Robert Jur here isn't just refuting or disagreeing with Confucius, he's implicitly giving an argument against him. He's saying the true human essence, true human nature is simply to satisfy your desires for things like food and sex. And what you advocate Confucius, the Confucian way is empty and artificial. It's an artificial uh, deformation or perversion of human nature. If you want to, if you want to follow and satisfy what you truly are, you'll act in your self-interest. Now, again, I'm not a follower of Yang Ju, but on the face of it, it's a it's a powerful prima facie argument. Uh, isn't it ultimately more natural to care about yourself, and doesn't it require a in some way a deformation of your nature to become virtuous? Now, Confucianism might have died under the twin attacks of Moist consequentialism and Yang Ju's egoism, were it not for this great philosopher by the name of Mengzi, who also lived in the fourth century BCE. He also has a Latinization for his name, also given to him by Jesuit missionaries, known sometimes as Mencius, and he also gets a stamp. Um, and uh, Mencius is a, a Confucian philosopher. Indeed, sometimes he's referred to as the second sage of the Confucian tradition. He's also a virtue ethicist. And part of what's distinctive about my own approach to studying Chinese philosophy is that I've really stressed that I think you can plausibly interpret most Confucians as virtue ethicists. And a virtue ethicist is someone who says, of course, we're concerned about the actions you should perform, but what we should focus on is what kind of character you wanna cultivate. And then we'll determine the right actions to perform by seeing what kind of character results in those actions. Mengzi has a list of cardinal virtues, the most important virtues, the virtues that encompass the other lesser virtues. Uh, and his list is benevolence, righteousness, wisdom, and propriety very different from the Platonic list of cardinal virtues or the much longer uh, list of Aristotelian virtues. Uh, benevolence is, uh, involves perception and action and motivation connected with having compassion for the joy and suffering of others. Righteousness, which you might think of as kind of like integrity, is the dis disposition to avoid 
actions that are ethically shameful, particularly cases where you're tempted by profit or desires for food or sex to do what is shameful. Wisdom is an executive virtue that consists in knowing the best means to achieve your goals. But wisdom also involves being a good judge of the character of others and understanding what benevolence and righteousness really are. Finally, propriety is, even according to Mungza, the least important of the cardinal virtues. But propriety is skillfully acting in accordance with social conventions. So Mungza recognizes that to be a fully successful human being, it helps if you know the right thing to say in various circumstances, you know the right ritual to perform, you know how to greet a guest, you know how to you know, cheer up a friend, you know how to behave at a funeral, things like that. And Mungza argued that human nature is good, but when he says that human nature is good, Mungza doesn't mean by that that all humans are born already good. Mungza means that human nature is good in the sense that humans have innate but incipient dispositions towards virtue. And using an agricultural metaphor, Mungza refers to our innate but incipient dispositions towards virtue as sprouts of virtue. And he doesn't just assert that we have them, he gives arguments that we have these sprouts. And one of his most famous arguments is the child at the well thought experiment against psychological egoism like the egoism of Yang Ju. So Mengzi says, suppose any normal human all of the sudden saw a child about to fall into a well. He, he asks us to think about this thought experiment. And he says, we would think any normal human would have a feeling of alarm and compassion when they saw the child about to fall into the well. Now, Mungs has constructed this example very carefully. He doesn't claim that you would necessarily act to save the child because you might freeze in, in the moment of crisis or you're, you might have a first feeling of alarm and compassion. And then your second thought might be, oh, if I rush to save the child, perhaps I'll fall down the well and get hurt myself. He says, all I'm claiming Mengzi says, is that you would have at least a momentary, initial, sudden feeling of alarm and compassion. And that reaction shows that the egoism of Yang Ju is mistaken, that we at least have, as built into our nature, these mo sprouts or incipient tendencies towards compassion for the suffering of others. Now, he says we have these, these feelings of compassion, which is the beginning of benevolence. He also gives another argument that we have a feeling of shame or disdain, which is the sprout of the virtue of righteousness. And that these are just sprouts. He says that we have to cultivate them to develop into full-blown virtues, right? So he's not claiming you're born with fully developed virtues. He's claiming you're born with an incipient tendency towards virtues and you have to cultivate these. And remember Aristotle, Aristotle says that you habituate people into virtue by performing just actions, you become just. By performing courageous actions, you become courageous. But Aristotle also says you need to have the right motivations in order to perform courageous actions or just actions. So how do you come to have virtues if, according to Aristotle, by nature, you're not virtuous, but you become virtuous by performing virtuous actions. How do you perform the virtuous actions if you don't have the virtues? Mengzi has a response. He says, you do have the virtues, but only incipiently. You've got to cultivate them. But the fact that you've got the sprouts is what makes it possible for you to perform compassionate actions to develop the virtue of benevolence. The fact that you have the sprout of righteousness is what makes it possible for you to perform some righteous actions and become a more righteous person. I know what you're thinking though. All students all think this every time we discuss amongst this, some students bring this up. Don't some people lack the sprout of compassion? Uh, and I'm dating myself here. This is a still from Silence of the Lambs, which came out many years ago. Great performance by Anthony Hopkins as someone who lacks the sprout of compassion, a sociopath who lacks the sprout of compassion. And so my students say, well, but would everybody have the reaction to the child about to fall into the well that Mengzi claims they would have? 
wouldn't some people not have the reaction? Well, guess what? Mengzi anticipated this objection. And he responds to this objection with the story of Ox Mountain. He says, the trees of Ox Mountain were once beautiful, but because it bordered on a large state, hatchets and axes besieged it. Could it remain verdant? Due to the rest it got during the day or night and the moisture of rain and dew, it was not that there were no sprouts or shoots growing there. But oxen and sheep then came and grazed on them. Hence, it was as if it were barren. People seeing it barren believed that there had never been any timber there. Could this be the nature of the mountain? Well, this is an image of a mountain that's been deforested. Uh, and so this gives you a sense of the kind of thing Mungs is talking about. And this kind of deforestation, uh, environmental uh, degradation occurred in Mungs' era as well. And then Mungs goes on to say, when we consider what is present in people, could they truly lack the feelings of benevolence and righteousness? That by which they discard their good heart is just like the hatchets and axes in relation to the trees. With them besieging it day by day, can it remain beautiful? With the rest it gets during the day or night and the restorative effects of the morning air, their likes and dislikes are sometimes close to those of others. But then what they do during the day, again, fetters and destroys it. Others see that such a person is an animal and think that there was never any capacity there. Is this what a human truly is? Hence, if it merely gets nourishment, there's nothing that will not grow. If it merely loses its nourishment, there is nothing that will not vanish. So Mengzi's Ox Mountain metaphor compares a sociopath, a human who has no feelings of compassion, possibly no feelings of righteousness, to a, a mountain that had been verdant, but was deforested due to environmental factors. And the suggestion is that likewise, yes, there are a handful of people who don't have compassion for others. There are a handful of people who don't have shame, but Mengzi's hypothesis is what produces people like that is bad environmental factors and bad choices that people make, which eventually destroy their sprouts of virtue. But he suggests, that's not what is natural for a human. And indeed, we regard people like this as ultimately inhuman. So he responds to this uh, objection with his metaphor of Ox Mountain. So again, we've got a thought experiment arguing for the existence of the sprouts, and we have a metaphor designed to respond to a potential objection to it. Well, if you're not buying uh, Mengza, um, you know, there's still other philosophers that you might be interested in. And one philosopher that I find my students almost always love is Zhuangzi, who lived also in the fourth century BCE. And Zhuangzi is classified as a Taoist philosopher. Taoism doesn't exist as an organized movement in the era that Zhuangzi lives. But he's later retrospectively classified as a Taoist. He writes in, a, in various genres including dialogues, poetry, uh, and just regular ex brief expository essays. And when you read his writings as a whole, they're just called the Zhuangzi. The writings of Mengzi are just called the Mengzi. The writings of Mozart are called the Mozart. The writings of Confucius, confusingly, are called the Analects. <laughs> um, but when you read the Zhuangzi, you find that he presents arguments for skepticism, that we don't know what the truth is, relativism, the claim that truth depends upon either your individual or your cultural perspective, and pluralism, the claim that there are a variety of different ways for fully realizing your individual nature and the suggestion that people's natures might differ from person to person. Now, if you're a philosopher, you might notice it's not obvious that these positions are consistent. Right? If I don't know the truth, skepticism, then I don't know that the truth is relative to my individual or cultural perspective. If I think yeah, I know that there are a plurality of ways of realizing my nature, that's neither skepticism nor relativism. So there's a couple of possibilities here. 
One possibility is that Zhuangzi was just too dumb to realize that his skepticism and his relativism and his pluralism were inconsistent. Uh, I think when you read Zhuangzi, it's clear he's plenty smart, so he could see that these are different views. And what it ultimately suggests is that Zhuangzi's arguments might be therapeutic rather than systematic. And I'm borrowing the therapeutic versus systematic distinction from Richard Rorty's work, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, that uh, whatever you think about the other classifications, the other philosophers that Rorty identifies as allegedly being therapeutic, like Heidegger and Wittgenstein, um, that Zhuangzi is a therapeutic philosopher and in Rorty's sense, meaning Zhuangzi isn't giving you a systematic theory of the world. Rather, he's undermining various systematic accounts as a way of freeing up your mind. But at the end of the day, he doesn't want you to buy into any of the different systematic accounts that he's undermining. Um, and I, I find it fa fascinating the way people respond to Zhuangzi. I know so many people who read Zhuangzi and, and they, they read his relativistic arguments, which we're gonna look at in a minute. And they'll just say, yes, I understand it. The one truth, the one absolute undeniable truth is ethical relativism. It's the one truth that will set us free. And the irony is in other parts of the Zhuangzi, Zhuangzi undermines relativism. And it seems clear to me, Zhuangzi, the last thing Zhuangzi wants you to do is to become attached to a particular ism. And certainly if you're overly attached to relativism, Zhuangzi will give you skeptical arguments to talk you out of relativism, or he'll give you pluralistic arguments to talk you out of skepticism because he wants to undermine every view you've got. And so in this respect, there's a way of reading, as I say, Nietzsche or Wittgenstein, later Wittgenstein, where this is what they're doing too. Now, interestingly, and Zhuangzi is the last philosopher we're gonna be looking at, so I'm, I'm, I know I'm a little bit over, but I'm, I'm, uh, we're coming up on the end here. So uh, Zhuangzi is the, uh, Zhuangzi is, uh, he's a younger contemporary of Mengzi's. And interestingly, Zhuangzi never explicitly mentions Mengzi. But if you read Zhuangzi carefully, you realize that he's often responding to Mengzi and criticizing Mengzi. And here's a great example. This is a line that uh, our translation in our translation of Zhuangzi was done by Paul Chelberg. He gets this right. Almost every other translator you'll find gets this line that Zhuangzi wrong. What the line says is, Zhuangzi writes, the sprouts of benevolence and righteousness and the pathways of right and wrong are all snarled and jumbled. And most translators don't know what to do with the first phrase here, which is, uh, oops, sorry, uh, run yi, run yi zhuan, the sprouts of benevolence and righteousness, because it is a weird phrase in Chinese. It's not clear what to do with it. And so most translators of the Zhuangzi don't know what to do with it. And part of the reason people are puzzled is usually philosophers either like Mengzi, the great Confucian philosopher, or they like Zhuangzi, the great Taoist philosopher. And so people usually spend a lot of time reading just Mengzi or just Zhuangzi. Then you got a handful of people like me who enjoy reading both Mengzi and Zhuangzi. So the people who end up translating Zhuangzi don't read Mengzi very carefully. So when they run into this phrase, run yi zhe duan, they don't know what to do with it. But if you've read Mengzi, it's very clear that run yi zhe duan is a reference to Mengzi the sprouts of benevolence and righteousness. It's a reference to passage 2A6, the child at the well passage we just were used, same terms used right here. So what is Zhuangzi saying about Mengzi's view? He's saying, it's fine to talk about sprouts of benevolence and righteousness, but how are you gonna identify the sprout you're looking for and distinguish it from a weed? And to illustrate this, this is a photo I took when I was on a, a tour in Indonesia being taken a tour of a swamp. And the, the boat, uh, the tour guide said, oh, look up there, there's a snake, there's a snake. I couldn't see the snake, but I took a picture and I went back to my room and I eventually, oops, sorry. Eventually I saw the snake. And if you look really carefully on this branch, you can see there's something wrapped around the branch and that's a snake. So Zhuangzi is saying, 
yeah, Mengzi wants us to cultivate our sprouts of benevolence and righteousness, but how do you know you're cultivating a sprout of benevolence and righteousness as opposed to a weed of vice? How do you distinguish the sprout of benevolence from the weed of condescension? So um, uh, somebody is accidentally, yes, I think it is a reference to Mengzi, so, uh, but please don't write on the screen. <laughs> So, and again, I'm dating myself here. This is from the delightful movie, Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, and Seymour here is cultivating a plant, but the plant turns out to be a monster. So likewise, you could understand Zhuangzi is saying, how do you know you're actually cultivating uh, a, a real virtuous uh, inclination is sort of a vicious one. Now that's a, that's a suggestive line of argument, but, but does Zhuangzi have a more precise line of argument? Um, He's got a couple and I'll go over them kind of quickly here because I apologize for running a little bit um, over. Uh, but Zhuangzi says at one point, that comes from this and this follows from that. This is the doctrine of the parallel birth of this and that. Now that seems utterly mystifying. So what is Zhuangzi talking about? Um, he's just pointing out a fact about language that certain terms like this and that in Chinese, be, that, and, and sure, this, depend on your perspective. So we might talk about this apple if it's close or that apple if it's far away or these apples if they're close or those apples if they're far away. So if I started referring to uh, this coffee mug and one of you in the audience called it that coffee mug, and you and I got into a heated argument about whether it, no, it's this coffee mug. And you're like, no, you're wrong, professor. It's that coffee mug. Everybody would know we were crazy. It's like, it's this coffee mug relative to my perspective. It's that coffee mug relative to your perspective. There's no real disagreement here. It's a purely verbal disagreement. And it turns out lots of philosophers in ancient China were interested in these indexicals, words whose reference depends upon the context of use and who's using them. And uh, another philosopher who often debated Zhuangzi was named Huizhe or Hui Shi. And Huizhe or Hui Shi had a series of paradoxes and you could interpret certainly most of them, arguably all of them in terms of indexicals. So one of Huizhe's paradoxes was he said, I went to Yue today and got there yesterday. And Yue is a state far to the south of the Chinese uh, what was then the Chinese homeland in the Yellow River Valley. Um, so how is it possible that you went to Yue today and you got there yesterday? There are various interpretations, but one way you might interpret it is, if I left for the state of Yue on Tuesday and I arrived on Wednesday, then it would be true for me to say on Tuesday that I went to Yue today, but it would also be true for me to say on Thursday that I got to Yue yesterday. Now, why is that important? Because once people like Zhuangzi and Huizhe noticed that there were these indexical terms, they started to worry that all terms might be indexical. And Zhuangzi picked up on this and applied it to ethical claims. Zhuangzi said, if a made up heart counts as a teacher, then who doesn't have a teacher? But to have right and wrong before your heart has decided, that's like leaving for Yue today and getting there yesterday. So Zhuangzi is suggesting that you, morality is not something in the world. Morality is something that depends on your heart. And just like terms like today and yesterday depend on a person having a perspective and a particular context, so do ethical judgments depend for their existence on there being a particular person who has a particular judgment. So Zhuangzi says in another passage, what is this is also that, and what is that is also this. That is both right and wrong. This is also both right and wrong. Um, and sorry. Uh, so what does he mean by this? He, Zhuangzi is pointing out, he's making use of an ambiguity in classical Chinese. In classical Chinese, the term this, sure, 
is an indexical. It's a, a relative pronoun. It can be a relative pronoun, meaning this. In that sense, the term sure, this is contrasted with be, another relative pronoun meaning that. But the term sure in classical Chinese can also be a verb meaning to be right or to deem as right, in which sense it is contrasted with fei meaning is wrong or to regard as wrong. And so Zhuangzi is using this ambiguity in classical Chinese to suggest right and wrong depend on your perspective, just like this and that depend upon your perspective. So morality is ultimately relative. So Zhuangzi says, how is the way obscured that there are true and false? How are words obscured that there are right and wrong? Where can you go that the way does not exist? How can words exist and not be okay? The way is obscured by small completions. Words are obscured by glory and show. So we have the rights and wrongs of the Confucians and the Moist. Each calls right what the other calls wrong and each calls wrong what the other calls right. In other words, the Moists think that impartial caring is right and filial piety is wrong. The Confucians think that impartial caring is wrong and filial piety is right. But this is like arguing, Zhuangzi says, over whether it's this mug or that mug. Whether it's this mug or that mug just depends on your perspective, just like whether impartial caring or filial piety is right or wrong only depends on your perspective. There are no facts independent of perspectives. Now, this is a fascinating argument and it's so fascinating that, as I say, some people read Zhuangzi and then they become super dogmatic relativists. And they're like, yes, the one true teaching that we must bow down before is the all holy teaching of relativism. Relativism will solve all our problems in life. There'll be a utopia if we all just believe in the all holy truth of relativism. But the irony is that Zhuangzi undermines relativism in other passages. And I'm gonna end on one final argument from Zhuangzi, again, I apologize for going over a little bit here, but, and this is Zhuangzi's regress argument. Zhuangzi says, look, once you and I have started arguing, if you win and I lose, then are you really right? And am I really wrong? If I win and you lose, then am I really right? And are you really wrong? Now, Zhuangzi does not define what's meant by winning and losing here. But I think that's actually a strength of the argument because Zhuangzi is going to say, define winning and losing whichever way you want. Maybe by winning an argument, you think what we mean is convincing the judge in the argument or convincing the audience in the argument. Or maybe you think that uh, winning an argument is correctly applying a set of rational standards but rational standards don't apply themselves. We need someone to judge whether or not the rational standards have successfully been applied and philosophers notoriously disagree about that. So all we really know in an argument is that someone wins and someone loses by some standards. Does the fact that you win the argument, say you convince the audience, does that mean you're right? We can't think that because we all know of cases in which someone wins an argument where we think they're wrong, right? So in the United States, uh, you know, there's still heated debate about whether evolutionary theory is true or something like creationism or intelligent design is true. And there'll be public debates on this topic. And sometimes in some cases, the advocates of intelligent design or creationism win the argument in the sense that they convince the audience that they have best applied the rational standards. Now, as somebody who believes in evolutionary theory, I don't think, oh, that means that they're right. Sometimes somebody wins an argument and you think that although they won the argument in some sense, they're not really right. Uh, people win arguments when they shouldn't win them. But then Zhuangzi says, but then all we really know in any argument is who won. We don't know who's right. Once you and I have started arguing, if you win and I lose, then are you really right? And am I really wrong? If I win and you lose, then am I really right? And are you really wrong? No, winning the argument doesn't mean you're right. Losing doesn't mean you're wrong. Is one of us right and the other one wrong? 
or are both of us right or both of us wrong? And this is really interesting because Zhuangzi is bringing into, into play effectively what's called the kataskati in Indian philosophy or the tetralemma, because he says with two positions, there's actually four possibilities. Could be that the first one's right and the second one's wrong, or the first one's wrong and the second one's right. Could be that they're both true, or could be that they're both false. If you and I can't understand one another, then other people will certainly be even more in the dark. Whom shall we get to set us right? Shall we get someone who agrees with you to set us right? But if they already agree with you, how can they set us right? Shall we get someone who agrees with me to set us right? But if they already agree with me, how can they set us right? Shall we get someone who disagrees with both of us to set us right? But if they already disagree with both of us, how can they set us right? Shall we get someone who agrees with both of us to set us right? But if they already agree with both of us, how can they set us right? If you and I and they all can't understand each other, shall we wait for someone else? So this is a really, I think, very powerful skeptical argument that you can't know what the truth is because all you can know is who wins the argument by some criterion or criteria. And you can't conclude that just because someone satisfied a particular set of criteria that therefore they have to be right because we always leave open the possibility that you could have satisfied the criteria but you weren't in fact right. Now, if you're really clever, it's okay if you didn't notice this, but if you're really clever, what you just noticed was, wait a second, Juanza, you just gave us an argument for why we shouldn't trust arguments. So your regress argument undermines itself. It also undermines Zhuangzi's argument for relativism. Because even if you think Zhuangzi's argument for relativism was completely compelling, all you know is he won the argument on relativism. By this argument, that doesn't show that he's true. So there's two possibilities. Either Zhuangzi is just too stupid to know that he's undermined his own arguments, or he's doing it intentionally because he wants to undermine all arguments. Well, if we're going to undermine all arguments, is there any point in talking at all? Maybe we should just stop talking if all arguments fail. Zhuangzi does not say that. Zhuangzi says, it's one of my favorite lines in the Zhuangzi, a trap is for fish. When you've got the fish, you can forget the trap. A snare is for rabbits. When you've got the rabbit, you can forget the snare. Words are for meaning. When you've got the meaning, you can forget the words. Where can I find someone who's forgotten words so I can have a word with him? In other words, Zhuangzi doesn't tell us to stop talking. He says, look, words are tools we use to point at. The word here for meaning is literally pointing. Words are tools we use to point at something beyond the words, but we can't fixate on the words. We're trying to fixate on what is the words are trying to get us to. So we're not gonna stop talking, but we're gonna realize the limitations of those words. And if this seems unphilosophical or unclear to you, then all I can do is introduce you to Ludwig Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein wrote this terrific work called the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, and he gives a theory of meaning in the Tractatus. And if you read really carefully the theory of meaning that Wittgenstein gives in the Tractatus, it becomes clear that according to the theory of meaning that Wittgenstein gives in the Tractatus, the Tractatus is meaningless. So does Wittgenstein conclude that we should stop talking? No, he says, my propositions serve as elucidations in the following way. Anyone who understands me eventually recognizes them as nonsensical when he has used them as steps to climb beyond them. He must, so to speak, throw away the ladder after he has climbed up it. The, fi the fish trap is for the fish. The rabbit snare is for the rabbits. Words are for meaning. When you get the meaning, you forget the words. And Wittgenstein concludes in a very Zhuangzian fashion, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. And Wittgenstein is a great philosopher, but apparently Zhuangzi and Mengzi and Mozi and Yangju are not philosophers because they didn't have the good taste to write in German. Thank you all. I respectfully invite your corrections. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we'll go to uh, 
Q&A session, I think we're a bit over time, but I think we should get about half an hour in maybe. Okay, um, great. So um, there are quite a few people, but I think there can be two ways of doing this. If you want to type in your question in the chat box and I'll, I'll read them out, that's, that's okay. If you want to raise your hand um, with the raise hands function on Zoom, uh, you can do that and you can just speak with your camera on or, or whatever, and we can get some questions in. Uh, yeah, sure, uh, Joffe, you can uh, you can type it on or you can speak. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's very, very impressive. Investing thank university, you. Uh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, investing universities, Chinese philosophy is mostly taught in sinology or China studies. How do you consider the differences of teaching and research of Chinese philosophy between philosoph philosophical institutions and the sinology institutions? A related question is, how should we understand American Chinese philosophy? How does this field differ from indigenous, indigenous Chinese philosophy? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, part of my answer would be, I have some colleagues who teach, teach in East Asian languages and cultures or Chinese language and literature departments or uh, area studies programs, and some of them do absolutely wonderful work. So I'm not dismissing them or denigrating them. But in general, there's a reason why philosophy should be taught in philosophy departments. That is, philosophers ask certain questions of texts. They have a certain kind of training for thinking about texts. They're familiar with certain kinds of positions, uh, and they know what the different options are conceptually. And so I think it makes a big difference whether philosophy, Chinese philosophy is actually taught in philosophy departments. So what I find, for example, is, um, I mean, uh, Hurley Creel, who was one of the giants of American Sinology. And when I was an undergraduate, I read Creel's book, Chinese Thought from Confucius to Mao Zedong. And uh, that was one of the very few works I could find uh, about uh, Chinese philosophy when I was an uh, undergraduate. And uh, one of the things that uh, Creel said in passing about Maudza was he said, well, what Maudza is advocating uh, is really a kind of egoism because it's really just enlightened self-interest. Now that anybody would look at uh, Maudza and would think he was an egoist or he was just advocating enlightened self-interest is just crazy if you're a philosopher, but that's what Creel thought, because although he was a brilliant mind, he just wasn't well-trained philosophically. And so what I find is that, although I do have some colleagues, as I say, who are in other departments who do really great work, very sophisticated work on Chinese philosophy, we need people who know how to analyze arguments. We need people who know the difference between different philosophical positions and can intelligently categorize uh, what Chinese philosophers are doing in the light of categories that, that are already available. And so that's why I think it's important to study Chinese philosophy in philosophy departments. Uh, I've occasionally heard people say, well, wouldn't it be great if we had philosophers in other departments too? Why are you so opposed to people hiring a philosopher who does Chinese philosophy in uh, a, an area studies department? I'm not, but that's not what happens. What happens is they hire someone who's a philologist or a social historian, and they don't really understand philosophy usually. Um, I, what I would ask my philosophy colleagues is, why do we need to teach Kant in the philosophy department? Why can't they just teach Kant in German studies? Why do we need anybody to teach Plato or Aristotle in a philosophy department? Why can't they just teach Plato and Aristotle in Greek and Roman studies? Uh, why do we need anybody who teaches Rawls, teach Rawls in American studies? But the reason is because Rawls and Plato and Aristotle and Kant and Confucius and Mengzi and Mozi and Zhuangzi are philosophers and philosophers study these texts in distinctive ways and ask distinctive questions and they deserve that kind of study. Um, in terms of your second question about the differences between study in say the United States or other parts of the English speaking world and the study of Chinese thought in China, uh, it varies a lot from scholar to scholar. I mean, I have some scholars in, uh, I regularly teach at Wuhan University in China, 
and I have uh, very productive conversations with a lot of scholars there. Um, I have other scholars I, I don't have as, as productive conversations with, uh, but the same thing is true in the United States. I have some philosophical colleagues I don't have you know, productive conversations with. So I don't think there's a fundamental difference between the way Chinese philosophy is taught in China and the way it's taught in the United States. I think it more depends on the, what's distinctive of the individual uh, who's teaching the philosophy. That's a great question, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Um, I have a question typed in from Axel Schneider, mm. uh, which says, um, I sympathize with your line of arguments as it goes against the condescending, at times even denigrating, uh, Chinese philosophy. But are you doing something similar when you insist on integrating things Chinese into our disciplinary department, thereby running the risk of forcing things Chinese into modern Western academic conceptual frameworks? Yeah, that's certainly something that we should be on guard against and, and we, should, we should worry about. But I think um, I'm more worried about people who have a very notion, and I'm not saying you do this, but there are people who have a very narrow notion of what philosophy is, right? So there was a fad in Ang Anglo-American philosophy in the 20th century for thinking that all of philosophy was the philosophy of language. And so for a while, there was a fad where people were studying Chinese philosophy and the only thing they were interested in about Chinese philosophy was the philosophy of language. And they tried to shoehorn everything in Chinese philosophy into the philosophy of language. And that really did do violence to the text because as we saw, there are thinkers like Zhuangzi and Huizhi who are genuinely interested in the philosophy of language and the later Moists have a lot to say about the philosophy of language, but not everybody in Chinese thought is concerned with the philosophy of language. So if we have an overly narrow conception of what philosophy is, that's damaging not just to Chinese philosophy or Indian philosophy, it's damaging to Western philosophy to think that all of Western philosophy is just the philosophy of language or all of Western philosophy has to be expressible in nice Aristotelian syllogisms when in fact, most of the time we don't do philosophy in the West and, and type syllogisms. So when, but when I look at someone like Mozza or Zhuangzi, and in particular, the kind of arguments I looked at, I don't know how not to interpret these as philosophy. And so if somebody wants to tell me that, oh, the caretaker argument, oh, you're really, you know, forcing that into a different category by treating that as if it were an argument for impartiality. It is an argument for impartiality. I don't know how else to read it. I'm open to other ways of reading it. If people want to tell me it's not doing what I think it's doing, but it pretty clearly seems like it's an argument. So uh, I think what we should be more, what I'm more concerned about is narrow definitions of what Western philosophy is that not only would do damage to uh, Chinese philosophy as we try to interpret it, but also would do damage to Western philosophy, because Western philosophy is a lot more diverse than some, uh, even of some practitioners of Western philosophy give it credit for. Uh, I, another thing, just to develop that a little bit more, a colleague once said uh, to me, well, yeah, I mean, I guess there are some arguments in Chinese philosophy, but there are also a lot of metaphors, you know, like the notion of sprouts is a metaphor, ox mountains a metaphor. And so that seems to me very different from Western philosophy. And uh, I responded by saying, if you had a student who wanted to write a dissertation on the allegory of the cave or the metaphor of the divided line in Plato's Republic, would you say, oh, that's not philosophy. Plato's not philosophy. He has all these metaphors about the cave and the divided line and the sun. There's metaphors, plenty of metaphors in Western philosophy as well. And interestingly, we forget how many metaphors there are in Western philosophy because we're so used to them. Aristotle's term for matter is hule. Hule is literally wood. And so Aristotle has to use this metaphor to create a technical language for philosophy. Or when we translate Aristotle's logic, we use variables like x. But what Aristotle actually uses in the original Greek is the word for cloak, because cloak, an actual physical cloak, is a metaphor for a variable in Aristotle's logic. So we forget how many metaphors there are even in Western philosophy. So uh, again, just real simple answer. Uh, it would be bad if we took a narrow conception of philosophy and tried to shoehorn Chinese philosophy into that. 
But a narrow conception of Western philosophy also would not do justice to the great diversity that you find in Western philosophy as well. Another great question, thank you. Okay, uh, next up we have Gerard. Uh, yeah. um, hello, uh, I have a question regarding the Tao, sure. especially it comes from the Chu, from Ch Chung Ying Cheng, when okay. he said that both objective and subjective meanings are essential to our understanding of the Tao. The Tao integrates both as well as transcends both. I wanted to know how does it particularly act with the objective and subjective and how do they affect Taoist ethics? Thank you. And is, is that uh, Chung Zhong Ying that, that you're referring to? Um, Chung Ying Cheng. Chung Ying Cheng. I'm not sure what that means. So I have to just to confess, I mean, does the Tao integrate subjective and objective? Maybe, I guess. I mean, I'm not sure what that means, so I don't know what to say about it. The, the term Tao originally is literally means a path. And so a, a Tao is a, uh, the original sense is a path very quickly by a metaphorical extension that occurs in Indo-European languages as well a way or a path in the sense of a literal road comes to refer to a way of doing something. And then from there, Tao comes to refer to the right way to live or the right way to organize society. So in most of the philosophical thinkers that we're, we're talking about, what they mean by Tao, by way, is simply the right way to live or the right way to organize society. Um, I guess, I mean, I'm not sure, again, what this philosophy you're quoting means by this. It, you might mean that the, the, the Tao is the right way to live or the right way to organize society. So it's the way in that sense. But you might also say it's subjective. I don't know if that's the word I'd use, but you might say it's subjective in the sense that it's the way I have to learn to follow. And it's the way that I have to make my way in life. Now later, and we actually see this happen in chapter 25 of the Tao Te Ching attributed to Lao Tzu, the classic of the way in virtue. The term Tao, meaning the right way to live or the right way to organize society, is adopted to refer to a cosmogonic principle, a principle or a thing that gives birth to the universe, that creates the universe. And you see this explicitly in chapter 25 of the Tao Te Ching. And I believe I was the first person to point this out that in chapter 25 of the Tao Te Ching, it actually says there is a thing that existed before heaven and earth that is the mother that gives birth to heaven and earth. And this thing, I don't know what its name is, but I'm gonna give it the style the, the polite nickname, the Zhe Dao. And so the term Dao is borrowed to refer to this principle or thing which gives birth to the universe as we know it. And that's a further extension of the term. So that's how I would understand the term Dao or Wei. It's originally literally, and it can still have this meaning in modern Chinese. You can say Dao Lu, uh, the, a way or a path or a road. By a metaphorical extension, it becomes a, a way of doing something. Then I come to refer to the way to live or the way to organize society. And from then from there, it comes to have a metaphysical use, specifically in chapter 25 of the Tao Te Ching, where it's adopted to refer to the uh, principle that gives birth, that, that exists before language and before the physical universe that gives birth to it and so is responsible for the way to live and the way to organize society. So that's how I'd understand it. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think um, I think uh, the the I think Gerald was referring to uh, Professor Chen Zhongying at Hawaii. That's who University. I thought. That's who I thought it was yeah, a reference yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah so, um, and next, I think we have Sunny Hu, if she's still here. Hi, Dr. Van Oden. Hi there. This is Sunny from University of British Columbia in Canada. Oh, I, woke up, I woke up so early for your presentation. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for doing that. Thank yeah. you for doing that. Okay, so firstly, I am a physics student in science, but I spent ah. all my electives in Chinese philosophy. And I really like your textbook. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Good, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so here is my question. Since I am a student in science, I'm a little bit curious about what do you think 
for some potential applications for Chinese philosophy to other subjects or our current world? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and by the way, so have you taken any courses with uh, Professor Slingerland? I knew who he is, but my professor is Dr. Clayton Ashton. Oh, that's great. He's great too. Yes, yeah, so. he's fantastic. And I am also a, a teacher, teaching assistant for him in the oh, history terrific. class. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Right. So, um, I mean, here's, here's what I would say. There was a... I'll just refer to there was a movement a few decades ago to find similarities between concepts in Chinese cosmology or metaphysics and contemporary physics. Um, I think my recollection is that in the long run, most people thought that the appropriations of concepts like yin and yang to things like particle physics were yes. a little fanciful, but there, there was a literature on that. So, and maybe that's something that we should resurrect, but uh, I'm just reporting that there was a, a, for a while, a movement to say, oh, we could actually apply yin and yang and five phases theory and the notion of qi. Uh, I mean, the notion of qi, 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 in Chinese thought, in a way, some people have suggested that's something like mass energy in the sense that you know, qi is spontaneously active and spontaneously generating in the way that it appears mass energy is in contemporary physics. So in some ways, qi is more like the mass energy of contemporary physics than it's like the matter of Newtonian physics, which is more passive uh, and fixed. Um, so, so you might make those comparisons, but to make it like a general observation, one of the things that is characteristic of uh, pre-modern thought around the world, most traditional pre-modern thinkers think that we live in a teleological universe in the sense that ethical values infuse the physical and biological world. So uh, in book 6a of the Mengzi, Mengzi is arguing with Gaozi, and Gaozi, are trying to argue that human nature is morally neutral, says, well, look, it's like water. You know, if you open an outlet in the east, you know, if you have like a, a container of water, you make a hole in the east side, the water flows east. If you make a hole in the west side, the water flows west. And Mengzi famously replies by saying, yeah, but water is not indifferent between up and down. Water will flow down you know, if you let it, and the fact that it flows east is just predicated upon the fact that it's trying to go down and the outlet you've given it to go down is on the east side. But that's not just a metaphor, I think, from Mengzi. I think from Mengzi, the fact that water tends to go down is the same kind of fact as the fact that human nature tends towards the good. These are both simultaneously evaluative and descriptive facts. But then in the West, beginning with people like David Hume, Hume famously introduces this fact value dichotomy. And, he, and Hume says, look, there's factual or descriptive matters which are objective and scientific. And then there's ethical or evaluative matters having to do with matters of ought and ought not, which ultimately for a, a neo-Humean are subjective because they depend on human passions. And so Hume, and this has almost become a dogma in modern thought that, you know, there's this is-ought dichotomy or a fact-value di distinction. Now, there's two ways you can go. I have some smart colleagues who say, well, on the one hand, I have some smart colleagues who say Hume was right, and there is a fact-value dichotomy, and we need to banish ethics from physics and natural science and biology. I've got other smart colleagues who say we can resume a, a modified teleological understanding of the universe because there are values built into the structure of the, in the universe just in a different way than we used to think they were. A third option, which, and that second option will be like a neo-Aristotelian kind of view. A third option, which I'm attracted to is the Kantian view, right? So we got to, I mean, Kant, you know, has to take his blame for having banished Chinese and Indian philosophy from the curriculum, but that doesn't mean he's wrong about everything. And Kant said, 
one way of understanding Kant is there's two ways to look at the world. You can look at the world objectively the way natural science does. And when you're looking at the world objectively the way natural science does, there are no values in the world. There's no ethics in the world. But you can also look at the world from the perspective of you as an agent making choices. And if you look at the world from the perspective of you as an individual agent making choices, you have to see values because you have to decide what you ought to do in a particular situation. And so these are not competing perspectives, they're different perspectives on the world. And so for me, the discussion of values, whether it's an Aristotelian thought or Platonic thought or uh, a Confucian thought, it's a matter of adopting that perspective of ourselves as agents acting in the world where we have to make evaluative choices and that's where values come in. But I, I think that values should be banished from physics and biology because the world that physics and biology and chemistry reveal to us is value neutral. But that doesn't mean we have to be value neutral because we yeah, can't- Exactly. Exactly, exactly. Because yeah. there's concepts- I think both yeah, natural science and the humanities are important to our world. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's one way. I, and I, I, I know I kind of went on like a long thing about that, but I think it's useful because I get lots of students who say, well, I want to believe in natural science, but I also want to <laughs> take Mengza and Aristotle seriously. And Kant gives you a way of doing that. He says, you are an agent and you can't, he, in the, uh, the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, Kant says, you can philosophize all you want, but at the end of the day, you can't make it go away that you're an agent making choices in the world. And as an agent making choices in the world, there are values and your values aspire to a kind of objectivity. You may fail to be objective, but your values you're trying to instantiate aspire to a kind of objectivity. And so that, that I think is right. So that's where I would bring it in. But, but if you think, you know, I, there are smart people who try to combine a more teleological view with physics, and you know more about physics than I do. And like I say, chi looks more like contemporary mass energy than it does like the atoms of like adult early modern chemists like Dalton or the matter of someone like Newton. Yeah. So maybe in a way we are discovering that after all Chinese philosophy was right about the ultimate structure of the universe. Great question, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm afraid I've, I've lost the chat record. So I think there was one question about um, about redefining the term philosophy so that it includes um, sort of wider scope of thought. I think there was a question about that. Um, okay. If someone can copy and paste, yeah, if you can see that in the chat box, Professor. Um, yes. Uh... Well, I'll, I'll answer. I'll just, I'll just answer the question as you as you formulated because that was a nice formulation, right? So, okay, sure. do we have to expand or should we expand the notion of philosophy? Um, there's a great book that that came out a few years ago uh, by an author named Smith. Uh, the uh, and I hope I'm going to botch the title, but it was something like the philosopher, uh, a, a study in six types, and it, it was this great book discussing the different conceptions of what a philosopher is and what philosophy is over different cultures and different periods in history. And the basic point it made, or at least what I walked away with from the book was, there's no definition of philosophy that will apply to all and only what we in the West, just limiting it to the Anglo-European tradition, have called philosophy because it used to be that philosophers did what we now call physics. The philosophers used to do what we now call biology, what we now call chemistry. That's why if you get a doctorate in physics, it's a PhD, a doctor of philosophy. If you get a doctorate in biology, it's a PhD, a doctor in philosophy. But those are now separate fields. So there's no definition of philosophy that will pick out only and all the people who historically have been called philosophers because philosophy has been different things in different eras, even if we just look at the Anglo-European tradition. So what I suggest in my recent book, Taking Back Philosophy, is that 
uh, you know, we should think about how um, we can think about what philosophy, and I'll give a shameless plug here. Here's my book, Taking Back Philosophy. And I, I talk in that work about what philosophy is. And I say, but we can define what philosophy is for us now. What is philosophy for us now? Philosophy is dialogue over issues that are important, but methodologically unsolved. So if a topic is important to us, but we don't agree on the right method for resolving that problem, that's a philosophical problem, right? So problems in physics, if it's a problem in physics, physicists disagree sometimes, of course, but overall physicists at a particular point in time agree about the method for resolving disputes in physics. Biologists agree about the methods for resolving disputes in biology. But what makes a topic philosophical is it's a topic we care about, but we don't agree about the method for resolving that issue. And if you look at it in that way, then issues in ethics, issues in metaphysics, what's the, the most fundamental kinds of things that exist and how are those things related to another? How, what is the nature of the self? What is the nature of political organization and the community? What are the obligations of the individual to the community? Uh, what are our sources of knowledge? Do we gain all knowledge through our senses or do there have to be other sources of knowledge besides our senses? These are questions that are important to us, but we don't agree about the methodology for resolving them. Now, if you define philosophy in that way, guess what? There is philosophy in China. There is philosophy in, throughout East Asia. There's philosophy in India and in South Asia. There's philosophy in Africa. There's philosophy in the indigenous American people because in each of these traditions, we find people presenting arguments, clarifying positions, coming up with new answers to these important but methodologically unsolved problems that confront us. And all you need to do is look and you can find people giving arguments, analyzing positions, giving answers to these same questions in South Asia, in East Asia, as well as places like Afri Africa and the indigenous Americas. So I think on any reasonable definition of what philosophy is, you find people are doing philosophy in East Asia and in South Asia, for sure. Those are the areas I know the best. My impression is I also find philosophy in the Africana tradition and also in uh, the indigenous American tradition, but I know those less well. But I'll guarantee you there's philosophy in South Asia and East Asia. Okay, I think we're running a bit short on time. I think I'll pour a young Drew here and be a bit selfish. I think I'll get <laughs> one more question in by myself. Okay before the thing ends. Um, it's just a lot of the talk was centered around the history of uh, Chinese philosophy and how sort of what they actually talked about. But I think uh, in the modern Anglo-American philosophy, a lot of the time, uh, even though we disagree with philosophers in what they say, we might use sort of their framework or their concept in sort of analyzing modern problems or problems we're discussing in modern philosophy. Like we might talk about the Humean theory of motivation or sort of the Kantian approach to, to practical reason and whatnot. So uh, what do you think is the sort of the most uh, promising or most credible sort of example of, a, of an application or sort of uh, reframing and adaptation of uh, traditional Chinese thought uh, in analyzing a sort of relevant and uh, hotly debated uh, topic in modern philosophy? Well, I, I think there are, are several, uh, just to give a few quick examples, um, as I noted, I think Mengzi gives a solution to the problem we find in Aristotle of how it is possible to become a better person. Because Aristotle says that human nature is neither good nor evil, but he says we become good by doing good actions. We become courageous by becoming, performing courageous actions and just by performing just actions. But Aristotle says in order for it to be a genuinely courageous or just action, you have to have the right motivation. So how is it possible to have the right motivation if human nature is neither good nor evil? And Mengzi's answer is, well, you've got these incipient dispositions towards compassion and a sense of ethically informed shame. Um, and so you can start to act on these things and you can gradually cultivate these. So I think that there's a very rich literature 
in the Chinese tradition, particularly the Confucian tradition, about ethical cultivation and the role of classic texts, ritual pr practice, meditation, um, and uh, action uh, under the guidance of others in ethical cultivation. So I think the ethical cultivation literature is very rich and anyone who's interested in virtue ethics or ethics in general should be interested in that. I think the Mungsian list of cardinal virtues is uh, benevolence, righteousness, wisdom, and propriety is a lot more intuitive and powerful than Plato's list of cardinal virtues, uh, you know, justice, wisdom, moderation, and courage. Um, I think that you find in Hua Yan Buddhism, which is a distinctively East Asian form of Buddhism, a very powerful argument that there are no individual selves, or that there are no substances in the sense that Aristotle and later Aristotelians talk about substances as metaphysically independent entities. And there's a great uh, argument by the philosopher uh, Fa Zong on this point. Uh, Fa Zong uh, and we have selections from Fodzong in Tewald and Van Norden readings in later Chinese philosophy. Fodzong gives a philosophical dialogue in which he argues that there are no individual selves and he responds to various objections to this view. And for a long time, I've been attracted to an Aristotelian view of objects and their properties, but Fodzong's arguments that there are ultimately no uh, Aristotelian substances is actually quite pa powerful. So I, I think people should look at the Hua Yan arguments of, of Fa Zong about the nature of individual selves in contemporary philosophy. I think they're very uh, powerful and interesting arguments. Um, and also you just, we need to remember in general, in addition to the intrinsic philosophical value of these thinkers, we need to keep in mind that we live in an increasingly multicultural world in which China is increasingly important President uh, or the paramount leader Xi Jinping of China uh, has praised Confucianism and has broken with earlier thinkers like Mao Zedong in praising Confucianism and encouraging people to the Chinese people to admire Confucian thinkers. And so it behooves us to learn something about this important philosophical tradition that Westerners recognized at the very beginning was philosophical, but then later got banished from the curriculum as the result of pseudoscientific racism. So I think there's a lot of reasons, both intrinsic philosophical reasons um, and also just general cultural reasons for studying Chinese thought. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think we'll have to come to a close, um, but just before we end, um, I'd like to thank Professor Van Orden for I think the excellent talk and uh, answers to questions. I think they're very clear. Uh, and um, just uh, one la last advertisement, uh, if you enjoyed talk the talk today, there's another uh, session on uh, on the 29th of October, and that's, that one's about economics and is on the new debt trap situation uh, in China, the US, and um, apparently on a topic called the new yellow peril. Uh, and that's given by two professors from Hong Kong, um, Professor Sortman and Professor uh, Yang Hairong. Uh, so um, if anyone's interested in that, uh, just keep um, posted with our Facebook events page. And um, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Van Norden once again. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your coming to hear my talk and uh, thank you very much for your excellent questions. Okay, that's great. And if, uh, if anyone wants to use the uh, review what was said in this talk, I will have this edited. Uh, and uh, post it on our YouTube channel or Billy Billy if you're in China. Um, and so you can just look over it if you want to. Okay, thanks everyone.